Welcome to the Tackle Your Feelings podcast with me, Dr. Hannah McCormack. Tackle Your Feelings is a positive mental well-being campaign brought to you by Rugby Players Ireland in partnership with Zurich Ireland and the Zed Zurich Foundation. We want you to rethink how you might approach your own positive mental well-being. With our guests, we will cover a range of topics, confidence, mindsets, life experiences that shape and mould who they are, what makes them more than a player. And joining me on the couch today, uh, we have two very special guests. We have sisters, which is very exciting. Uh, first, we have Emer Constantine, a uh, winger and back for Ireland, and her club is UL Bowes down in Limerick. Um, Emer actually played sevens first in 2013, and then it wasn't until 2017 that you moved over to 15s, and it was when I was doing my little kind of like, who is Emer and what has she done? I didn't realise you played for Ireland before you played for your club. Yes, yeah. So which is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mental. I did it all backwards. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you're also a previous Clare County Gaelic football and camogie player, um, a dual player, and you also work as a school teacher and presenter. So very busy lady. Um, and then our second guest is Ailish, who is Emer's little sister. I'm sure you love being referred to <laughs> as that. Um, and Ailish has been playing Aussie Rules in Adelaide since 2018. Is that right? She went over for five whole seasons, which I was actually really surprised at. I didn't think it was that long, but yeah, five whole seasons. Um, also, obviously, both of you are from County Clare. So Ailish, you were also a dual player, camogie and football. And um, you have a degree in exercise, science and fitness. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Great. So some really impressive people from a really impressive family sitting on the couch here. Um, it's good to know the Wikipedia is up to date. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was for a while. I'd be laughed at that. <laughs> Thank God. Because you're like, I know these people. I don't need to have these mm. stats. And then you're like, well, actually, no. Like for you, I was like, oh, Ailish has been in Adelaide for two years. And then it's like <laughs> yeah. two years since the last time I saw you. So you've yeah, been there it's, for it's a little bit it's, it's actually flown by. Like, it, you know, even when I signed in 2018, I was like, wow, that's... That seems like only yesterday and now it's like five seasons later and yeah, yeah it's just mad. To think Two premierships time. later. Two premierships and three grand finals. It's, yeah, it's yeah, time, crazy journey. Time moves yeah. in like incredible ways. So one of the first questions I always ask our guests is how they got into their sport. And obviously, Ailish, you're the first person who isn't a rugby player <laughs> on the couch. <laughs> Oval ball, uh, close enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Same, same. Um, so I'll actually ask you, how did that transition? I know a lot of people go from Gaelic football into AFL, but how did the transition from uh, being here in Ireland, being signed for AFL, going all the way over? Like, where did that come from? What happened there? Um, where did it come from? Yeah, it was a very kind of short journey that led into the AFL um, over. It kind of all started here with um, a guy called Mike Curran who ran the AFL Ireland in here and within Europe and they kind of randomly started a tournament here in Dublin just mm -hmm. for people to give it a try and do something different and I came along because Mike is from from Kilmahill and his sister Rosie just grabbed a few of us together to make a team and that was kind of the first in, first introduction the first time I touched the Sharon and like the first time I actually you know had anything to do with AFL and from there we played a couple of tournaments within Dublin and we we went over to Amsterdam for the Euros and we won that because we were just a group of Gaelic footballers adapting our sport to theirs yeah. and we were just you know we had the basic skills so um and then this cross coders camp got set up um by Jason Hill and Lauren Spark who played with the Bulldogs at the time and they were looking for international talent and they brought over I think 18 girls to Melbourne for trials and you know, not every team from the AFL were there, but a couple of teams were, and Adelaide were, were one of them. And they, in fairness, had a really good presentation and mm -hmm. um, about their, their team and pro probably were the least well-known as a club from this side of the world because no one knows where Adelaide is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of Australia's best-kept secret. Um, but, yeah, honestly, when I went over, because Emer had been in Sydney, my, my eyes were kind of set on maybe going to Sydney as, a, as, a, as, mm -hmm. a, as an option. And then when Adelaide came up and offered a contract, it just felt right straight away. And 
I I obviously took it. I was like, they're offering me something. I'm going to take it straight away. So so I did, and it kind of went from there. And they flew me to Adelaide for for a day, and they showed me the club, and they showed me. Um, I met one or two of the girls at the time that I didn't even know who they were, but like I got to know them so yeah. well after that. And then, yeah, I had a I had a think a month to come home, pack up my stuff and everything, and then fly over to Adelaide and and start the yeah. the journey as it was over the past five seasons. So. Mem's, it all. Mem's worst fear was how do we console Ailish after coming back from Australia when she doesn't get offered anything like Mam was <laughs> yeah. like oh how are we going to like Mam thought like this is just a random opportunity yeah, yeah. she'll Which go over she'll go over and she'll come home just as quick as she went over but you rang me at like three o'clock in the morning yeah. our time because it was the time difference and you're like oh, I got offered a contract and I was like try not to roar <laughs> the house down with it but um, I think you were just as surprised as yeah, as no, we were. I, I didn't. Ex- I didn't. I went out there to take off Australia off the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, as a holiday destination, because I was like, I'll never get there because football and Kuwait just go all year round. Mm-hmm. There's no break, so I don't. I won't get a chance to travel. So I honestly didn't expect anything to come from that, and the fact that there was, you know, interest from Adelaide was 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 crazy. Yeah. And um, Eva, you also had like a not straightforward journey into rugby. So even though it happened a couple of years before, Ailish is not so straightforward journey into AFL, you went straight into playing sevens. So what kind of encouraged you to get onto the seven scene, get into rugby, like having played Gaelic and Camogie again, loads of transferable skills, as we know from Ailish's experience. But you were kind of, that was like five years earlier, you tried a completely different sport. What was that? How did that happen? And what was that like? Yeah, I think my me moving into a random sport from Gaelic and Camogie helped you actually as well because we were able to like bounce off each other and figure out like well this was hard and this was hard and even though we're athletic the skills and the game understanding were like completely different to mm. us um but I was living in Dublin I was playing Camogie and football for Clare traveling up and down three four times a week and I suppose got to a stage where it was just a lot to do on top of a full-time job and they were scouting talent similar like that from girls from other I suppose sports and at the time, because Sevens was in the Olympics for the first time in 2016, and there wasn't, I suppose, a player pool mm-hmm. of players. Um, and me along with, like, I know Louise Galvin came at the time, Lucy Mulhall, Stacey Flood, like the girls who are, you know, stalwarts of the Sevens programme since, came over from other sports. And that was, I suppose, what they did at the time was just transfer over the skills. Um, and I said, look, I'll try it. And if it's awful, if I'm awful, if it's awful, I'll just go back to Camogie and football. I had a, yeah. the safety net of still been able to play a sport I wasn't giving up mm-hmm. my football and camogie life just for rugby I always could go back to it and it wasn't easy and there were so many times I did contemplate going back to Gaelic and camogie because I was bad at something like I was really bad at the start and even though we'd watched rugby and we were big monster fans I didn't understand the game and I didn't when I went to play it I realized just how little I knew and I think mm-hmm. I look back now and realize oh my god I knew nothing yeah and still like you're learning yeah but um I never, like we grew up in a little tiny village in West Clare, Kilmahill, and we never like set sights on AFL or rugby or playing for, playing internationally. Like if, like I said, I've said before in, in plenty of interviews, if I ever imagined playing for Ireland, it would have been through athletics because that was kind of what I was at underage and it was my only opportunity to play for Ireland mm-hmm. because for Camogie and football, you can't play for Ireland. Um, so it was, it was a dream that never, I never imagined because I didn't think it was possible um, to be from West Clare and actually be able to play rugby um, and like you said I played rugby first for Ireland before I played for a club so I went from Gaelic football to sevens and we and my first tournament was in San Diego with the sevens team playing against Canada and USA who were like seeded number one and two at the time mental and then came back and played interpros and then played a game with Bows and then went and got called yeah. on to the Irish 15 squad in 2017 the year of the World Cup and was part of that World Cup squad that was in Ireland and I've been part of the squad since so it's um it's been like an up and down route and it wasn't straightforward and this was the pathways have now been put in place for mm-hmm. players to get to the level I got to um through rugby and um, which is fantastic to see but it was definitely unorthodox the way that I did yeah. it but it's interesting because like you even mentioned there that you know the pathways are set now but even if you go back to when you guys were growing up and even I think I'm a little bit older than you, but like women, women and girls playing sport back then when we were kids, you were at least where I grew up. It was more 
an unusual thing and it may have been the school that I went to it may have just been like I did athletics I played Kamo I tried to play Kamo uh, not very well um, and around the age of 15 I stopped playing most sports and it wasn't until I went back to college and I picked up more uh, sports and actually that's where I started playing rugby but what was the kind of sporting was there much sporting encouragement in your community what do you think brought you into sport was it from home what were your kind of inspirations there? Yeah, I think we were lucky. Yeah, I think our club, we always had an underage football team. Um, hurling kind of came in and out through the schools programme that we had, but we always had football. That was kind of our, our mainstay. And we even played with the boys all the way up along. We played with the boys for hurling as well when that was introduced into our club because we're mainly football club in West Clare. But I think we had the opportunity in terms of a, a structured club to actually go and train and play with them. We had two coaches that were nearly coaching the entire parish at that stage yeah, Rose and Dorigan and Marie Egan who, who did it all the way up along and they Marie coached every it. girls team yeah Marie is still yeah. coaching but it's it was a mixture of the the structures were there for Gaelic football but also our family was really into it like our mm. brother used to make us play with him at the backyard our, our three cousins played for Clare at the time um, so we grew up looking at ladies football and going to their matches and like the media was very different then in that there was no social media I'm sure women's games weren't in the papers as often as they are now no. so we used to go to those games because our cousins were playing but also Keith played for Clare and our brother played for Clare as well and our weekends were spent going to their matches so we I suppose grew up wanting to be with them wanting to play for Clare wanting to support our brother and our cousins Um and our mum would have played sport as well underage played mm -hmm. camogie and her sister Maureen our auntie would have played for Clare for camogie back in an era where and women in didn't Ireland. really one in all Ireland, Ireland yeah. where women didn't really play sport so mm -hmm. I think we were very lucky in the family that we were into but also in the the community that we were into that it never was an obstacle there probably was more opportunities for men to play and boys to play sport but we were happy with our football and our athletics and and we didn't know any different yeah yeah and is there, do you find even, is there a difference in Australia with the attitude to women's sports? I know there was a lot of controversy a couple of years ago over a photo that was going around of Taylor one of your, yeah, like, and obviously we know that there's some attitudes towards women's rugby that we'd love to, you know, reverse or it's, it's an ongoing process. And I like the fact that it's a process moving forward, but is there a difference in Australia, do you think, or...? Um, a little bit. Um, I think since the introduction of the AFLW competition, um, you know, there's there's certainly been a broader um, view of women's sport and how, you know, impactful it can be. I think even in the first, I think, two years of the sport of AFLW actually run their comp, I think they had a 300% increase in women's football clubs mm -hmm. around all of Australia. So like the massive impact that they've had community wise and for girls ha having pathways. But I think I think the more professional it's becoming and more full more that it's gearing towards full time, which is, you know, within the next five years, um, it is certainly going to be scru scrutinized more. And and I think that that's a pro and a con, because I think the the men's game is highly scrutinized. And, mm. and because of the level that it's at and the, you know, the extremely high wages that they, they earn, it's um, <clears throat> I guess on par when women's sport does come to that in Australia, you know, you have you will be scrutinized more because, you know, there's bigger financial gain and and, you know, bigger um interest from a broader community. But um I think the AFL that we have done it really, really well in terms of they've really put their broadcasting and their um their advertising towards people that want the game to grow. Um and I think they have probably learned that you're not gonna change the attitudes of, you know, people that are of, of a certain generation mm. or of a certain view and what you need to target is the new generations coming through and the people that are willing to change and willing to have an open mind because you're kind of wasting your breath really with, with a certain minority of people that don't believe that women should be playing fo sport full stop, not to talk about contact sport. So I think the AFL have, have really pushed what they have and tried to grow the game, game as quickly as they, they can by, you know, showing the best of what they have and, and it's you know, they've really had an open mind and the AFL have pumped and I think they've, they've, take, of money. they've taken a financial code originally yeah, to, of course. to show it off and to put you on the big stage and to give you make you full-time, part-time professionals and the wages are increasing year by year, mm. but they took a massive cut at the start and a gamble at the start of the AFLW, I suppose, yeah, season. They, they were certainly willing to take a financial hit because yeah. they knew, you know, 
in the early um, early years of the game, it's not going to make a hell of a lot of money at the start. And to be fair, they've introduced an awful lot of new sponsors <coughs> that were not a, par- a part of the men's game. And I think you, the AFL have looked at that and have seen that there is value within women's sport. And um, I think... Yeah, like being able to take that hit and, you know, seeing that, seeing the future that can be there and just, you know, the equality for both male and female yeah. have the same opportunity. I think it was something that the AFL, you know, can be commended for and, and how they've really mm-hmm. pushed this to be an equal kind of standard. And even and the, the grand final that she won in 2019, we, mm-hmm. myself, my mum and my brother went over for the weekend to watch it, which is crazy, but I'm so glad we did. Mm-hmm. But the entering, entry fee into the final, into the Ove, Adelaide Oval, which is like a 60,000 capacity, was free. It was free entry yeah. in, but the, there was like 55, 56,000 people yeah, it was, at it. It was, full. 50, it was completely, 50, by the end of the mm-hmm. game, the whole oval was completely full for a standalone women's game to have that crowd. And yes, it was free, but the AFL were like, look, we're willing to open it up to the world mm-hmm. to have more people to come in to make the atmosphere yeah. and the spectacle of a grand final amazing. And they took a massive financial cut to do that, but yeah. it was phenomenal, the atmosphere. Yeah. And is that, what? what's it like? Because like, you guys, again, you grew up watching women play sports. You had a lot of like really positive role models in it now. You're potentially seen as role models for a lot of young girls because we are now in the age where things are being publicised and being, things are being advertised and female athletes are being, you know, the can't see, can't be. But for you guys personally, is it... Is there a mixture of emotions that comes with that? Because one, you're, there must be a lot of pride in being, you know, held up as an example, held up as like the Considine sisters or individually, obviously, with your own, in your own respective sports. But is there frustration that there's still quite a bit to go? Like the financial hits of the A of Hell have taken women's rugby's only just gotten professional contracts in Ireland Um like, is there, what is, what are the emotions that kind of go around with that? There's a lot in that there. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the role model thing, I suppose you don't realise how much role model you are until, and I think Ireland, we're, very, we're a very funny nation. We don't give people compliments. <laughs> and it's not often, it's not often you get a compliment until like you're leaving or until, you know, um, it, it, and you do. And then it's, it's lovely. But <clears throat> like, I, I'm obviously a teacher and I teach in all girls school and half the time I don't think they know what I do. I think they think I'm gone on holidays every time I play a Six Nations game and for the World Cup qualifiers there last year in Italy when I was gone for three weeks I think they thought I was sunning myself in Italy mm. you know but but there's a there's a cohort of girls that know what you're doing appreciate what you're doing and like at the end of the year or at Christmas or when they're leaving the school finally after six years you get lovely notes and cards that they don't tell you about mm. for the five years or six years you've taught them and you realise just how much of an impact that you've had on them in a relation to not just a teacher, but as in a sporting career mm. and being able to balance the professional lifestyle of a professional athlete while working. So it's, it is, it is nice to know that, but then I suppose there's the added pressures of it too, because you are constantly looking to see, like we were in the gym the last day, um, last week and two ladies came up to us talking about, oh, we know everything you do and you're home from Australia and you're still playing rugby and like they know you and there's like you how many people you're just always on you're always been watched mm. especially when we're I suppose at home because we are the Constantine sisters like we kind of go as a pair um so there's I suppose that added pressure of knowing the people are watching and then what you're doing is been not scrutinized but it's almost like that you are a role model for people whatever age you are um because yeah the Constantine sisters kind of come as a as a pair yeah and is that like how do you manage that pressure like what is because you know there is a little bit of anonymity I suppose in Dublin there is obviously anonymity a lot in Adelaide, in Adelaide. <laughs> yeah. sure people don't know where Adelaide is exactly yeah. they don't even, they don't even know where I am yeah, so, in any country in the world um but like how do you deal with that pressure like you said before you kind of were able to talk to each other about um you know that transition into the sport is there a conversation that goes between the two of you that is like you'll never guess who said such and such to me today or someone came up to me or anything like that or I suppose it's like a mixture of the social media thing as well and that what you what you see on social media isn't always the real thing and especially for you know me as a full-time teacher that's my job you know at the end of the day that's my job I'm not paid to be an athlete so 
when it comes to my content on social media, it's like it's very boring. Do you know? It's, and then the odd the odd time you happen to do one nice thing, you put it up, but it's not real either. Do you know? I think yeah. that's social media is a kind of it ties into that. That's probably the hardest part of it is the expectations of others around like Six Nations or training or um, gym programs and sponsorship deals or partnerships that you have to put that up because it's kind of fake. You know, it's not my real life. And yeah. I suppose it's just, it's, like it's a, a balance. life, but we don't, we don't share our private, like we, like while we have public Instagrams and whatever that may be, but it's only like the a surface. tenth of what actually yeah. happens in our life. Like, like I'm at the gym pretty much every day. Like I'm running, doing a run session three, four times a week. It's yeah. like, but like don't you don't see that or like you don't see that and I guess I have I haven't really been home that much, only a little bit I guess in between seasons and stuff. So I guess I haven't really adjusted to the um, you know people knowing a lot about you. I, I've had the an anonymity or however, yeah. however you say it um, in in Adelaide for you know the majority of of the twelve months of the year. So I guess when I come home, I kind of forget a little bit what it's like people knowing everything about you or people recognizing you especially when you're at home on the streets and you know just kind of bumping into people that you know mm-hmm. here there and everywhere and you kind of forget what it's like to to be back in that situation yeah. and sport is so important where we're from that it's like I'm not saying that we're getting big-headed about people knowing us like not everyone does but if you're in the sporting world in clear because of our GAA background and then I suppose the fact that you've gone the world stage and I'm playing for Ireland it's just you're a bit more recognizable and sport is I suppose very important to a lot of people's lives but um it's yeah to answer the second part of the question which was about the um like the frustration the frustrations yeah. yeah it's it's good to see that it's going in the right direction I think for women's sport I think as I'm teaching an all-girls school I've been there for 10 years and I see that it is getting better through through the media through the 2020 campaign through I suppose more people have been more vocal about it, about, you know, not just not just that, not just sitting down when things aren't right. It's like, no, we this isn't right. This is there's an inequality here. So let's just address it Mm -hmm. as opposed to just sit down and be quiet. I think that's the difference. And people are seeing the value of. Of how good the sport can be, whether it's Gaelic football, camogie, soccer, rugby, AFL, people are actually seeing, my God, the skills are good, the the like you know they're very similar to what the men do or but it's more just awareness because it's out there more and mm-hmm. um, it has a long way to go and I even saw an article the other day on Twitter about like a lack of coverage in the in the papers about women's sport and it was a big final I'm not sure which final it was but I suppose yeah if you compare it to the men's finals it probably would have got a whole lot more coverage but again there's still people fighting for it so um the AFLW were probably ahead of the IRFU, but the IRFU yeah. were getting there. You know, they're they're making the process, and it's not going to happen overnight. With you know, like they were successful in the AFL with pumping money into the top, down, whereas I think the IRFU were going the oh, bottom up. up. Yeah. So we will see the fruits of it very soon, um, and even like I said plenty of times, I never even imagined in my time playing rugby that there would be professional contracts. So it's still a, a great step forward. Yeah. And even just so speaking of role models then, like you kind of mentioned your your mum, your aunt winning all our medals, your cousins playing. Um, who were your other kind of role models growing up and who would your role models be now? I suppose growing up, we probably looked at that Clare football team. Yeah, I know. It's mad. Um, <laughs> they were so, like one of my yeah, three final. So they, won, they were <laughs> clear, They were senior at the time and our, our three cousins were playing on that team. But, um, you know, they, they're just... And we went to every game. And we used to have a little autograph book. Yeah, and we, had, we used to send it into our cousins into the dressing room so that everyone would sign it, so we'd have it. And we went to every we game. Were obsessed. And any training session that would have been on, like locally, like we'd go collect footballs or we'd be there or we'd yeah. be in for all the team photos if we could squeeze yeah. in at all possible. Like we really looked up to to those girls and you know what they did. We probably didn't take an ounce of notice what football they were playing because mm. of that age. No, we probably no, didn't, we didn't really hear what they were. was happening, but they were just so. Um, yeah, we just followed them and just looked up to them so And like much. every time we'd, like every match we'd go to and they'd sign their our autograph book, they probably signed it five times that year. Yeah. But the more that we met them, the nicer they were. And they were like, mm. oh, we'll see you the next match. And we'll, you know, they were just really, they gave up their time as well, yeah. which is funny. Like, and we, then, just, we just wanted to be like them. Like when we grew up, we wanted to be playing for Claire like they did. There wasn't very many other female role models around. And I suppose it wasn't on no. TV. Mm. Um. I obviously had, had an athletics background. So Sonia Sullivan was probably the only person that even made it onto a TV screen that was a female athlete. 
Yeah. But she won silver in the Olympics. Like you shouldn't have to win <laughs> an Olympic silver medal to make it onto the TV. So what hope had the clear ladies footballers of making it on TV at the time? So, you know, it just showed that you had to be, if you were a female, you had to be ridiculously successful to make it onto mm-hmm. the TV screens at the time, which is, I'm glad it's changed. You don't have to win medals to be on yeah. the TV screens. Um, but yeah, we suppose we lacked in the female role models. We went to the girls' games, obviously, and then our brother played for Clare as well, underage. So we used to follow him around and and go to his matches growing up. And that's probably where our kind of love of sport came from. Mm. Yeah, and probably the drive to, you know, that ambition, that dream to play yeah, for Clare I think is probably where that came from. One of the girls on the Clare team actually wrote in our autograph book, I hope to see you play for Clare someday, <clears throat> which was kind of like, oh my God, we yeah. could play for... It was like the... The eye opening that we could yeah. actually play for Clare. And that almost written down made us aspire to yeah. want to play for Clare. Yeah. Because she wrote it down in an autograph book. So something so little had so much significance on us. Such a big impact yeah. on your your goals and your beliefs in yourselves even. Yeah. Like it was yeah. not play there was no goal there, say play rugby for Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> or play AFL. Or play AFL professionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because being a professional athlete was not even an option yeah. for a woman. And how about now? Are there any people that you look up to, like even if it's teammates or other <clears throat> or even competitors that you have who are kind of like like the attitude or the drive or just their approach to things that you kind of really admire? <laughs> you can say each other yeah, if you I was going to say, Ailish <laughs> makes me train, which is great. <laughs> um, yeah, like Ailish hasn't had like the smoothest of transitions to to the top. Mm-hmm. In that you probably always lived in my shadow. But then you overtook me. <laughs> like, you like <laughs> overtook me. And you became a professional athlete. Which is, I suppose, if 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 you had to have money on which one of us was going to be a pro athlete, you probably wouldn't have picked it. No, I wouldn't have picked you. <laughs> yeah. But I think you just worked really hard at it. And worked at, like, you always had the skill. You just never had the, I suppose, mindset to want to... You were always happy just being there in the background. So it was you just kind of... Um, not like not that you're not an inspiration to me, but I think it's a more inspirational story. And Ailish came into my school recently to chat about her story, and it wasn't the I trained and I made every team underage. She didn't make any teams underage. So I think you're you're for younger girls growing up who think that they're not the best right now. It doesn't mean that you can't be the best mm. in time, yeah. because you didn't make underage teams. You were the sub goalkeeper mm. for the under sixteen Clare team. The first time wearing the number sixteen. Yeah, and then when she got the number 16 jersey as a professional contract, I was like, well, the irony of it, because she wasn't yeah. good enough to even start. And then she was the sub keeper, not even yeah. the outfield player. Um, So I think that's inspirational, and especially for younger girls growing up, that like you might not peak just yet, but that there is still absolutely... Mm-hmm. If it's something that you want, if that goal is written down, like yeah. like we had in our autograph books that you will play for Claire someday, that like there is an... Op- like you eventually got to senior rank and started, but you didn't. She didn't always start, which is... Um, it's a nice lesson for people out there and I know there's lots of other men like I think Henry Shefflin was the same he didn't make any mm. underage teams when he was when he was playing and they're just kind of nicer stories you know people don't really care about the people who were good all the time and made it to the top and that <laughs> um, but it's a nicer story to hear that it is possible Oh absolutely because I think there are so many people out there who they think they have to be you know <clears throat> the best from the beginning and like you have um was on the radio on the way in Tiger Woods' son was playing with him this weekend they were saying 13 year old child prodigy blah 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 blah, and you're like big things are expected and sometimes when you're a kid if you don't have the talent then it can be very easy like I said I was 15 now I went to a school that was very musically inclined so it was kind of sport was a, a secondary thing and I think that had an influence on me kind of stopping sport for a while but um, and I had grown up playing loads of sport, so I knew I was always going to go back to it. But I can imagine there are lots of people who maybe, you know, go in, haven't had a background in sport and never get into it. Or, you know, I wasn't the best at different things, but I wanted to do it because I enjoyed it. So, like, knowing that there are stories out there of people who can get to the top, but you, you, don't, you don't have to be that child prodigy, you don't have to have like 50 million gold medals yeah. in your in your <clears throat> childhood bedroom to show and off. that it's not too late like you said you were 15 when you dropped out of sport and then you went back when you were in college I 
was 23 taking up rugby. You were 20 what? Taking up AFL. Like, I have girls in school that with COVID, I suppose it caused a lot of dropout and especially mm. well, across the board, not just men's sport, but women's sport. But a lot of girls dropped out of sport at the 13, 14, 15 age, which is always, always difficult anyway to retain them. But they didn't go back and they're like, oh, I just feel embarrassed going back. Oh, I've missed a year. I've missed two years of training. And I was like, stop. I I did not start until I was 23. Like You have so much time. Mm. And I think it's realising that it is never too late to go back to something or to try something or um, look, what's the worst that can happen? You'll be bad at it and you can just go back to just your normal life again. You know, whereas if you just try it, at least you say, well, like, I gave it a go. I didn't like it or I gave it a go and I actually love it. I'm going to stay doing it. Yeah. But having the fear of not even trying is something that I find a lot of people, especially mm. women in sport when they drop out it's the kind of the you don't want to embarrass yourself you don't want to yeah. not be good at something um which is hard and it's been making yourself I suppose be vulnerable in a situation and like I'll admit it wasn't easy to change over I went from being good at something to really bad at something but I suppose that's just a, a mindset as well and I suppose the cherry at the end of it was that I got to potentially play for Ireland so it was a nice draw and the potential as well with yours is that you have to live a professional lifestyle like there was a benefit at the end of it but it, it wasn't easy but it's what the moral there is that you're never mm. you're never too old to to start something yeah. new I was gonna say what was the thing that kind of drove you to keep trying because again it'd be very easy like I grew up in a household where my brother was and he still is one of those annoying people picks up whatever sport he wants to pick up and he's good at it even sports that I'm like this is my sport and then he'll try it and I'm like stop it <laughs> that's it <laughs> now <laughs> but like obviously growing up you've kind of mentioned there that Emer would if anyone was going to put money on either of you becoming a professional athlete it would have been Emer. but it ended up being you and Emer says you've overtaken her in terms of like where you've gotten to but what was that like being the the younger sister you know not being picked be, being handed the number 16 jersey and then what kind of made you go no I want to keep going because there are so many people out there boys and girls who would be like well if I'm not good enough to get on to the starting you know 15 or the starting 11 or the starting whatever I'll just stay at home yeah I guess with in relation to her and you know being been the star of the two is I think my personality probably helped a lot in that because I really only had pride like when I used to see her play and be the star when I couldn't be it myself I could always fall under that shadow of knowing that well she's my sister so that's you know partially me and I guess you're happy with that <laughs> so I, like I was just happy with that I was happy to be like associated with that because like I knew how close we were and always were and I guess I can claim some bit of credit as, a, as yeah. a younger child that, you know, I was the one that kept kicking the ball under her head and she eventually put her hands up to catch it. You know, it took a while, but it happened. I was um, useless at the start, <laughs> So I just felt immense, I guess, pride associated with, with being her sister mm-hmm. and, you know, even if I didn't play myself, um, which, yeah, and on a more personal, I guess, it, for me, it was frustrating. It was, it was constantly a downer, like... Probably behind it all, I knew I was good enough physically, like or you know, skillfully. I knew I was good enough, but um, and probably just immense stubbornness. Um, I, I'm very stubborn. Yeah, you do. Yeah, within me, and I think knowing, you know, I don't have very much self belief, and I didn't. I had quite, I had quite low self belief at that mm. stage of my career, um, all the way up along. But I think that internal, like little flame, that knew that. I'm skillful enough, I know that I'm good enough and I'm probably, you know, more skillful than a lot of players on the field. But, you know, as as you progress to get older, fitness becomes an issue. And it was my issue and I wasn't making teams because I wasn't fit enough or fast enough. And, and I was told multiple times that, that was the reason. So I think I just needed someone to probably believe in me and kind of coach me in a way that... Um, Stuck to your strengths. Yeah, rather than focus constantly on my mm. weaknesses. And I think... I, I went through the motions and the, probably the majority of people that I played with on those clear teams up along that were sitting on the bench with me, they stopped playing, come mm-hmm. under 14, under 16 and minors. They just weren't there anymore. Um, so I eventually did make my spot because we were short players. <laughs> so, um, and I think once I did and, you know, had a couple of good games and proved my point a little bit, I think that probably gave me a little bit of confidence. And I think 
separating from from you going to college was probably another thing I didn't want to do at the time but it was probably a good thing for me because she she went to UL and and started there and I went to Trilly and a smaller college um and definitely um we did a lot of running in you know our, our pre-season and it was probably good for me to have football and camogie all year round so I had like most people put on you weight. kind of went as a nobody yeah digitally. yeah I was your sister but that was about it um no one really kind of knew who I was or what I mm-hmm. could do and I think that yeah not and just yeah I kind of had to start from scratch and prove myself all over again in a very different um way and in my first year of college I think I played in the forwards and then come second third and fourth um I was midfield so I was completely transformed in terms of fitness levels and but it came from the coach like having value in you yeah could see potential in what I could give and could see the skill level that I probably knew that I had but probably couldn't get out because no one showed belief or Mm. um in that you were stuck in corner forward which meant like you weren't able to show off the distribution skills or the catching skills or the I suppose awareness skills or the reading of the game or but then when he put you midfield he could see that those skills were way more important and I suppose you had to run more at midfield yeah. you had to yeah. get your yeah. kind of and of course what, so. what I was studying was you know, health and leisure so it, you know it was a natural progression from learning all about you know health and fitness and then also implementing it on the football field and I think I fell in love with health and fitness from there and then and it's been you know absolutely part of, of every day since then yeah. and that was certainly something that drove me on and yeah that just that little belief uh in me from you know external people I think made a big big difference in my career at that stage and because it wasn't just mum saying you were good <laughs> yeah because like, your mother will tell you you're good anyway even yeah. if you're not she'll you know she'll keep telling you are um so yeah and and then like you know it wasn't just on the field I actually got awards I got scholarships I, you know these things were been um given to me after my time in Tralee and it was just you know that that external recognition for something I wasn't used to. Like, mm-hmm. I would never get player of the match trophies. Like, she would have a stall of them. And, like, you don't have room for all the ones she had. Um, whereas, I was looking to get a starting jersey. Like, that was, you know, as much as I could hope for. Um, so I think, yeah, like, the, the hard work certainly did. And there was a lot of hard work. And there was, um, it certainly did pay off um, at that stage. And I think I had a new confidence going in. And then... Um, went on to UL and, and played a bit more sport there at you know at a, at a next level again and you know probably felt like a bit of an outsider and like a bit worried that I wasn't going to make the team because UL is really high standard and she would have played there and there was a bit of a legacy there behind that but you know some incredible training that went on there and then you know I started to make my place on the county team um, you know week in week out with you know very little question whether I'd be in the team so like that certainty was something that was really strange as well and it was um yeah like just a whole lot of hard work and constant focus on you know getting fitness better and you know getting strength better and you know just constantly working hard at it and you know been my entire life and and then yeah I kind of just I got a few lucky breaks (laughs) which also helps um I think though, like people talk about luck is, you know, they say, oh, this happens, but you have to be willing to, you know, there, there, there are definitely instances in people's lives where an opportunity is presented to them and that could be seen as being very lucky. You could be in the right place at the right time, but unless you think, well, I'm going to give it a go, you can let that luck pass you by. So I always say to people like, yes, things might happen unexpectedly. Yeah. And from the outside in, it's a lucky thing. But if it wasn't for your approach to that situation, you could be like, oh, no, I wouldn't be, yeah. you know, I wouldn't be good enough to try it. So, But that's it. Know, if it's not an opportunity taken by you, someone else will take it. Exactly. Someone else will get that contract. Someone else will get that jersey. So it's never a missed opportunity because yeah. someone else will take it if you don't. And it, yeah, it's the it, bravery, I suppose, to go and exactly. try it. And like you mentioned before, the kind of vulnerability of like, this is a lucky break you have to you have to be willing to step into outside of your comfort zone into that vulnerable space because if you don't then someone else will take it on and yeah. it, that's not to put the pressure on that you have to take every single yeah. opportunity that is ever presented to you but I think more people need to take more credit for themselves when it comes to these lucky 
breaks so that's what I'm saying to you Eilish don't don't <laughs> sell yourself short but it's really interesting to hear that like you personally said that you didn't have a lot of self-belief and it potentially came from yes. an outside source that saw some value in you looked to your strengths and encouraged you to then start believing in yourself yeah whereas Emer, would you say you would have been fairly confident growing up or was it something that a similar situation to Ailish or no we were completely different yeah. like I knew I was good if people told me I was bad I probably was like no I, I know I'm still good like <laughs> I had this ridiculous self-confidence but I suppose it came from like past performances past experiences that I knew I can score this from this angle I'll take the shot mm. I've done it before it was you know it's, it's high self-efficacy that I think I always had because I had done the hard work. It's not like you said, it's not luck. I trained hard. I practiced at it. I always wanted to be the best, my high standards of myself. But also I knew in the past that I'd had, you know, I'd potential to do this because I've done it in the past and um, I was driven and motivated internally. I didn't really care about what other people thought about me really. On the field, um, I kind of just knew that I had the confidence myself to be, mm -hmm. to be that person and to be the best and want to be the best. And I was valued as well on the outside of teams. Like I was picked, you know, like there wasn't a question that I was going to make a team, but whatever team it was, I don't ever, I think there was like twice in my entire life I've sat on a bench. Yeah. Like it's a completely different experience from myself and Ailish, like really completely different experience. And it's just bizarre because we did everything together. We didn't like we got the exact same food, clothes, bedtimes, sleeps. It just shows yeah. that personality yeah. is everything. Like we're yeah. completely different people and we got the exact same um, upbringing and opportunities and treatment. Yeah. And it, we're just completely different people. Yeah. And I think that's, again, I would say the same myself and my brother. He was always and has always been a very confident person or that's how I viewed him. Whereas I'd probably be a little bit more like Ailish and kind of be doubting myself or, you know, kind of questioning, like looking for someone else to be like, no, you're actually OK at this or, you know. Um, so it is interesting that you can grow up, be in the exact same environment. It doesn't mean you're going to have the same path. But um, I can't imagine that when you were younger, you had the awareness or the, the insight to be like, that's maybe a difference between us. But if you could give... If you could give a young Ailish some tips on what you know now and even what you know of her, like kind of from your own experiences, was is there anything you would say to someone like Ailish who's like maybe not as confident or doesn't have that self-belief or that you wish you could even go backwards and say at 14, 15, what you could say to your younger sister? Yeah, I think it's what you said a while ago about you found the coach that finally focused on what you were good at instead of focusing always on your fitness or focusing on, which is the, the feedback, if feedback you would have got in the past would have been negative, negative, you're bad at this, bad at this. Maybe that comes down to the coaching style, but also I think if you could get, really focus on your positives, like to build confidence and, and focus on what you're good at, make them your super strengths and eventually your confidence will build because you're getting better at what you're already good at. I suppose just, there's no point, um, I suppose believe in what you have, that that, that is enough to make a team and what like not everyone is good at everything you know but stop looking at the negatives and look at the good things because there is always good things in whatever it is whether it's life or whether it's your ability in sport or whether it's your ability in school there's always like you were never good at Irish but you were very good at art <laughs> and maybe mam would have been like focusing on the bad of Irish the, how bad you were at Irish but <laughs> She wasn't that bad, right? <laughs> you actually were. Really like, you, actually were <laughs> you were actually pretty bad at it. But you probably heard more about that yeah. at home than how good you were at art or how good you were at text drawing and stuff. Whereas I was just focus on what you're... Yeah. Focus on the positives. And that's, yeah, that's definitely something that... It's easier said than done, I have to say, that you kind of... We're very quick. And even I think you said it earlier that in Ireland, we're very poor to give... We're very slow to give people compliments unless... <laughs> you know yeah unfortunately unless it's like you're leaving or yeah. it's someone's wake for but you hold it in and it's like it's it's kind of a practice a habit to build to be like either looking at yourself and going no I've done that well yeah or even saying it out loud to the people who are important to you as well 
Um, but just to kind of, I've kind of glossed over all of these <laughs> questions because we've had such a good conversation. But I suppose I want to know, is is there a big life lesson that you've learned? Or if you can look back kind of, you know, um, you've had, Ema, you've been in rugby since 2013. You've been obviously on the Clare um, dual player for a lot, much longer. Same with you, Ailish. You've kind of, you've both played sport all the way through college, all the way through school, underage. And, you know, 2018, you became professional. Like we were saying, time has just kind of gone really quickly. But through that period, what was the biggest life lesson that you learned? Or even beyond that, that kind of brought you to the, where you got to, that kind of influenced you? What would you say that was? I would probably say to give every opportunity a go in that if it works out it's great if it doesn't your life really won't change that much at least you can say that you tried it and if if you don't at least try it you might always live with the regret of well what if I did this or what if I said yes or answered that phone call or responded to that email mm. about this opportunity and that um there's nothing you're not going to lose anything by trying by trying yeah. something um and that was me with rugby but it's it's trying anything. There's no right time. You could be planning things like forever and ever and there's no right time to do things, whether it's like a moving job or a new opportunity or setting up that new business or there's no, you can time things to perfection and it still might be the right time. So it's just taking the opportunity when it comes as opposed to planning for for everything because that's not how real life works out. And was there anything that like gave you that lesson or was it a light bulb moment that you had because of a certain situation or is it something that someone said to you or like what happened there I suppose with the rugby it was never a goal never a dream of mine and it was I very early on was kind of struggling with with the game and with the training and with work and that and mam just said no like look give it a go and you just I think you need someone as well sometimes you doubt yourself all the time you doubt yourself you doubt your abilities you you have imposter syndrome you're in playing an Ireland squad and never thrown a rugby ball like you doubt yourself so often and you just need somebody to in your ear just to say no keep at it or um you know it, it'll be worth it or try it a little bit longer not not pressure it wasn't like mom put pressure on me to do but I think she realized that it was too soon to judge if you're going to be good or bad don't just give up straight away you know it's you're never good at anything you just forget how bad you were like like we played the piano and I'm sure we were pretty bad at the start. We're not great now, but we, you know, in the same with football, I was awful. Like Ailish tells tell the story about her kicking the ball at my face. The amount of times the ball hit my face and I went in crying, didn't want to play with her anymore. But I eventually learned. That's very accurate. I eventually learned. <laughs> There's that skill coming in there. Yes. Like she was very accurate at it. Yeah. yeah. But I was useless. And like you forget that just because you're 23 being bad, you, you have a tendency to give up quicker. Mm. Whereas four-year-old, five-year-old me went in and cried about 10 times before I realised put your hands up and catch the ball and then it won't happen again. But you forget that you're bad at everything that you start at. Yeah. And that it's, it is going to take time and have patience with it. Yeah. And what about you, Elish? Would you say, what was your kind of biggest life lesson? In it's probably there? pretty similar to what you said, but probably another thing for me was I always tried very hard. Like I always tried really, really hard to make every team to do everything that I did to do everything right, to, to learn as much as I could. And, probably put so much pressure on myself all the time to be you know better and like my, my head would get in the way all of the time when I play like there'd be games where I just wouldn't show up yeah be absent I'd be there in person and mm. and like nothing would go my way or nothing would go right and there was many days that it happened and mum said she wasn't going to go back <laughs> <laughs> mum said she was never going to go to her match ever again if she played the way she played one day <laughs> <laughs> yeah she Tonight, was it yeah, I think I was playing a Kwagi game with, with Trilly. It was a final or something. It was a big it was, game. It, we, it didn't really, I think we had won the, the game or it didn't really matter. I think we were through it. It was something anyway and I just didn't play well or didn't show up. I don't know what it was, but um, yeah, she would get out to me after. But um, I think I definitely had a lot of games where I was so frustrated by the end of it because nothing happened and mm. I couldn't get into it or so many things just didn't go my way and I think I used to let that get on top of me and I think as I got older especially with Claire I had the you know the outside pressures of not having to worry about being on the team because I know I had earned my spot that I was going to be on you know somewhere in the forward line or midfield um, 
And I think I just needed to get beyond that phase of worrying about my performance and worrying about how I was going to play and, and just play. And I think that that came. Um, and it's not a lack of care or a stop caring about the game or stop caring, but it was just a, a bit of a letting go of the pressure and the expectations and just going out and playing. And mm -hmm. that was something that took ages to come like years it was probably in my last two three years of playing yeah do you remember the Claire? game in Croke Park they got to the All-Ireland yeah. Intermediate Final and you'd had you'd actually had, had pretty poor performances up to then yeah pretty because average. her aim for the season was to get to an All-Ireland Final get in Croke Park because you'd never played in Croke Park yeah. and then finally when you won the semi-final the shackles were off and you had a fantastic performance in Croke Park yeah, it because was, the aim you you got there. Yeah, yeah. I was the there. pressure I, of getting I, I there. I got through the training sessions. I knew that on Sunday that we were going to play in Croke Park, and that was it. You know, so whatever you happened after that didn't didn't matter. It you was just had fun there. Yeah, and it, it was a great it was, game. Yeah, it was just walking on Croke Park, and and that was it. And great, like that that was the goal. If we won, yeah. lost, obviously it mattered. But you know, that wasn't really part of the process or the plan. So yeah, I went out and played probably one of the best games for Clare and, you know, scored a goal and, you know, but we did lose my point at the end, but, you know. But you were still happy It's still a massive memory in, in, in my sporting career that, you know, I always cherish because it was the first time and only time so far that I played in Crocker. So I think that was probably a real, like, learning curve that, you know, I really didn't focus on the game. I was just in the process that happened. Yeah. And I think... I had a lot of that in my first season of AFL where because I was just so probably ignorant to what the game was and what I was supposed to do and, you know, the the style of play. And I think all the unknown probably helped me kind of play a little bit better in my first season, probably outplayed what I should have done really mm. and played more games than what was definitely expected. And then in season two, two and three, I was so overwhelmed by what I didn't know because I was so hyper aware of the game and how it should be played and all the things that I didn't know and the structures and everything and I, I got back into the phase of overthinking and I was like what have I done I've left where I was you know perfectly happy to go out in the field play the game of my life and walk off again and not have to worry about it in Gaelic football and now I'm here overthinking everything again and I think um, season four and season five I kind of threw the shackles off especially season four didn't get much games because I had me injury this year but um season four for me I you know I just like I knew what I knew and I didn't know what I didn't know and that was it and I went and played football and you know I was able to play my role I was able to secure my spot week in week out for you know a premiership win inside so like it was again it took a while but it was something that I had to look back on that I had learned previously to to essentially stop caring so much and stop putting so much pressure on and it's probably something you've been able to do. Yeah, like with the big games, like a lot of people flop in big games. But yeah. I, my mindset around big matches is, why do you bother training at six o'clock in the morning, doing a gym session or training in the mud on a winter's night to play badly on the big day? Yeah. So my thing is like, why why get nervous? Why get anxiety? Why? And I know it's easier said than done. And I, and I actually don't get nervous for matches. I don't either. Yeah, that's something that we, we both... <clears throat> Because oh, it's like, well, I'm here to show everyone just how much I've trained and just how much I'm. Yeah. So like I'd, yeah, that's I. I don't really get nervous, the big day. Yeah, if you could bottle that and sell it, yeah. you guys would be millionaires <laughs> <laughs> for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, you both mentioned your mum being and you, the amount of nuggets of wisdom that your mum has kind of shared with you over the years, and that you've consequently shared with us through tackle your feelings, Emma, but. Um, she sounds like a massive support that you guys had but I'm just wondering like was there anyone else or you can obviously talk about how much more support she gave you and how much belief or even the little kicks up the arse of not coming yeah, back to a game with you <laughs> if you keep playing that way but um, like growing up who were your support networks or who were your kind of the group of people that you potentially leaned on for both the good and the bad stuff and are you the type of people who have the same supports now or how has that, you know, evolved or kind of gone in since kind of making your way through? And I know I keep piling these questions on, but even Ailish, like, have you ever felt, were, were there any supports that kind of when you got those professional contracts or you went to Australia, was there any, did you find any resentment from any people who you thought kind of would have previously been happy for you and then things changed or anything like that 
to be honest not really I think for me because I was kind of the surprise package like in terms of like we said earlier if it was anyone to get a contract it would have been you everyone would have thought you would have got it so I think people were mostly genuinely happy that you know I had got it managed to get a contract to to go and play professionally and I think a lot of people that really knew me knew how hard I work and and how much I guess I had given to you know our our club football and um, county football you know in the lead up to it now obviously I had to miss a county final which was quite hard um, to go for the trials which you know was probably you know difficult for the club to understand at that stage because you know I was missing the county final for essentially you nothing, know, nothing at, yeah. at the time mm -hmm. but I guess coming home in a contract kind of made that a little bit easier to understand when it happened and I think after that people kind of only wish me well and 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 that kind of thing um but it's been and I we came back and played the year after um and won a county final but it's been it's been hard to kind of balance the two since since then because you know even with COVID and you know the difficulty getting over and back to Australia during that time and you know I kind of put a lot of pressure on if I got injured or anything like that happened um you know I had to make a call that I couldn't play club and you know it's it's hard to take when you know some of your better players can't play for your club and it's hard to obviously watch on and not be able to be part of that so there was a couple of difficult times around that and not being able to to do that for for the club and you know for for them not having you know the best players possible play for mm -hmm. them so but I think but, oh, and so who supported you in those kind of like you said they they are difficult decisions for you to make so who would be the people who you kind of would go like because we all have those people yeah. who are like is this the right decision yeah well I guess so I always looked to Ema and to to Mam and Keith and as family and like they were always kind of the moral compass and or the ones that would have your back. When we always say it that like we probably have a smaller friends group at home because we were we had each other. We never we if we went like out or for training or if we went to the cinema or if we did anything, it was just we had each other. We had instant friends. So we have probably a small friends group when it comes to home because we yeah. always had each other. So um, yeah, and a couple like we don't couple of close friends, small, yeah. Like, you know, close friends at ho based at home, and then I've got a couple that I've I've had from college. I've got three main friends that I've had since I was in college in Limerick, and you've got a couple that you've had since college. Um, so like, yeah, we don't have a broad, broad range. Like we've obviously lots of friendships, like from different clubs and different teams that we've played along, um, but very probably small. I probably have to mention my husband. He'll kill me if I don't. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that guy. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> he's, he's the reasoning behind a lot of decisions, or if there's like anything it's the you've one or two people that you go to mm -hmm. about like you'd ring ma'am ring dean and ring you whatever it's depends on the situation and, and who's involved <coughs> and, and where we are if you're at home generally you won't catch Ailish on the other side of the world because she's the worst yeah. for contact so <laughs> if it was an urgent <laughs> issue I wouldn't be ringing Time Ailish yeah. in Australia because she's really bad for contact <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah it depends I suppose on the situation yeah. And that's kind of been pretty constant then that you've had, you know, each other, you've had your brother, you've had your mom. And then obviously since Dean came along, he's yeah. been there as well. Yeah. But, no, I um, and I think that's a, it's a good to kind of point that out because there's often a misconception for a lot of people that we need to have like the the people with all of the friends are the, the luckier ones. And it's not to say that they're not, but it's the quality of relationships that are going to keep you through and like you know that you can ask those questions of that are like am I making the right decision and they'll genuinely have your best interests at heart and I'm sure you do well like you've referenced each other a lot but I'm sure you do the same for each other so would you say you're very honest with each other you're kind of the biggest supporters but would you be able to take criticism in a nice or like <laughs> <laughs> like how do, you, do you ever get into like big fights or anything like that or disagreements or is it kind of yeah <laughs> oh. I'd be pretty real with Eilish a lot of the time yeah she's uh, yeah pretty real yeah. most of the time yeah we're very different personalities as you yeah. can see yeah yeah but no yeah you're good for compliments I'm probably good for the reality check non compliments yeah the reality <laughs> check side of things there and then we compliment each each other well, but yeah. We, and your mum obviously is 
seems like a she's of, a bit of both. Mixed. She's mixed then. She's got the soft side of things, but then sometimes. the and then she can go harsh sometimes as well. So she's the balance really that you need. Yeah. 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 And then um so I'll ask you one more question of the big questions as they say because I'm just I don't know we've been chatting for a good bit now but um obviously I know with sport and especially with women's sport Ailish you were lucky to be contracted professionally Emer, you've maintained a career as a school teacher the whole way through but um I always ask like what did you want to be when you were growing up and what do you want to be now <laughs> When you, when you grow up. Good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, when you yet. grow up, when you, what you want to be when you grow up? That's a very good question. It's a, it's a, that's a question I've struggled with since I was young. Um, I think I've always had a love for sport. And I think um, growing up, I was always outside kicking around, doing anything, pretending to be a professional soccer player or pretending to be a professional tennis player yeah. or pretending we were in Wimbledon. Um, yeah, like before there was yeah. even women who were professionals, Eilish wanted to be yeah, a professional, anything, that was just, anything. Yeah, just any sport, any sport that I could mm-hmm. pretend to be professional. So I think really that was kind of where my aims were and I think... Um, Which it was completely unrealistic, like, in our oh, eyes. Yeah, like, actually, <laughs> like, <laughs> dreamer, um, in the sense. But, I'm like a <laughs> Yeah, no, and it did actually come through, true, so... Um, and and now I think, oh wow, uh, this is also another. It's going to be on camera now, so that this everyone's is, going to know yeah, what, what is, you say. This, here. this is one of those real conversations that Emer has with me about, you know, <laughs> what you need well, to be like, in your I mean, It is an unfortunate thing that you know, you're once you get into your kind of mid thirties, you're seen as that's it. Yeah. Like for especially for the sports that you play, and I know there's always exceptions to the rule yeah, like I'm, Lindsay Peet is still yeah. playing and I'm, I'm, looking, at, I'm looking at Cora <laughs> yeah going, yeah so, exactly um yeah like obviously for now and for the next couple of years the plan is to continue playing if you know if that's possible but I guess after that I am lucky that I have done my time at, at college and have got my degrees and stuff so it certainly is a good base to start from but I think from what I'm you know passionate about and that's sport health fitness it, you know it's more than likely going to be something down that road now it could be something completely different altogether but I think right now where where I'm at I think it's probably something down along those lines but like would you get into coaching or would you potentially yeah and like that could be any sport that could be in high performance it could be in AFL it could be football mm-hmm. Kamogi, I, and I guess it could even be rugby I could probably do something contribute to something towards that but it could be anything at this stage I think I've got a broad enough scope of sports at this stage that you know it could be anything and and obviously I I would love to see women's sport become a lot more equal in Mm -hmm. in every sport not just AFL not just rugby not just football movie everything should be you know on par in my eyes at this stage where you know male female shouldn't make a difference it should be the same all around for everything if that's work sport you know in society so I think you know if it has to be women's sport where where I start off and try and you know build pathways to make that a more equal thing it would be something you know, I would be interested in too. But yeah, there's a, a broad scope of things that um, I always say I'm a jack of all trades, master of none, because I've a lot of different skills and and talents, as you'd say. But yeah, just to try and narrow the, the focus is, is something that I find hard to do unless I'm kind of just plopped into something and then just go from there. And how about you? Would you think you obviously I'm the teacher, absolute so. opposite then. Like, <laughs> I had a plan that I wanted to be a teacher my entire life. <clears throat> And I just basically that I just worked. I just wanted to be a teacher. Like I literally knew that I wanted to be a PE teacher from, I think it was like fifth year LCVP, but to do like a research project on like a career opportunity. And I <clears throat> wanted to be. I think you might have skipped that module. A PE teacher, yeah, I think you might have been missing for that. I wonder what you actually did it on. Your career investigation. I don't doing it. And yeah, like I had to research like the points and the course needed and everything. And like I was adamant I was going to UL because at the time. It was, I think, the only college that did mm-hmm. PE. So yeah. I was like, I, well, I'm not going anywhere else. I didn't put any other course down in any other college. And they were a good football team. And they were, played O'Connor Cup, which was like one of the, you know, that I never actually won an O'Connor Cup, which is an Irish did after <laughs> going back. And like, I was like, of course you did. So like, it was, we literally tried <laughs> so hard. Yeah, and, a, and an Ashburn, a Camogie oh, College one. O'Connor Cup and Ashburn. <clears throat> um, 
like my aim was like be, be, a, be, a, be a PE teacher late, late bloomer that's I was the, say, you can take bloomer. all of those like play with the match yeah. and stuff and yeah. 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 like I've literally won nothing century. really like in the grand scheme of things yeah. like <laughs> you've all the personal accolades and I've won the collective yeah been part of the crew um, which kind of sums us both up as well because I would be very driven towards like my own goals and you were happy to be team player, a team player right? yeah in that um so do you think like you can see yourself staying a PE teacher until yeah I love it I really do kind of and like I I love teaching girls I love the fact that I can be in like a role model and impact in their lives in the sporting world I think it's a nice link to be a PE teacher and an an athlete at the same time um or just f- promotion of female female sports in general I just am passionate about it and um I suppose giving people opportunities that they never mm-hmm. really knew they could do or give them the belief in that as well so yeah I'm my path is kind of my. I'm going to plan along my path at the moment. <laughs> Yours um, is just like this, and mine is just like. Yeah, mine's. I suppose you could look at it and say it's quite boring, and Ailish is very adventurous, and you don't know what the next door is going to open. But that would give me sort of panic that I couldn't plan something. Out. I, think <laughs> I think it's just so interesting that you have two sisters who, like you said before, you were given exactly <clears> the same <throat> opportunities, brought up in the same environment, similar life experiences, obviously different, slightly different ages or whatever. Um, two very dis- different personalities but like you know you're still successful in your own ways and you're still yourselves in your own, like I know that's a very obvious statement you're <laughs> yourselves in your own ways like there's that doesn't come across the idea of like Ailish you've always been proud of Ema but you've never wanted to be her in that or that's what I'm picking up like that there wasn't that kind of jealousy or the yeah. envy of like I want to why is this not happening for me and same with Emer, you're like you know you're very proud of what your sister has done and the joke of it the you know Ailish winning all of these cups and trophies and stuff for their teams but I'm sure there's immense pride in what you've both achieved for each other. And I'm sure for your brother as well, like even you, uh, I could hear it when you were talking about him playing. Yeah, he's sick of being known as Emer and Ailish's brother. <laughs> <laughs> but he was the first yeah, one to but play. But very proud. Yeah, 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 very yeah. proud at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I think we're done with the big questions. So I want to say thanks again <clears throat> for for giving such incredible answers to those. Um, what we'll do is we'll finish up with our quick fire round. So instead of asking you both the same question, I'll, I'll kind of alternate between the two. Um, so just, yeah, just to finish up with these these short, quick questions. So whatever you think, first thing to come to mind, that's, <clears throat> that's what we want to hear. So Ayla, I'll go with you first. Staying in or going out? Staying in. <laughs> that's not even a question. Emer, <laughs> <laughs> would you rather read a book or watch a movie? Movie. Um. Ailish, would you talk about it or think about it? Think about it. I'm actually going to ask the same. Emer, what would you think? I would absolutely talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Emer, um, time alone or time with friends? Um, depends on the mood. It depends on the mood. It really does depend on the mood. Yeah, more with friends. Maybe yeah. with friends. Um, Ailish, would you listen to a podcast or a playlist? Podcast. Um, Emer, cooking for yourself or ordering a takeaway? <laughs> takeaway, yeah. <laughs> um. Ailish, what was your favourite childhood TV show? If you can remember. Were you too busy outside playing oh. school? Yeah, we never really were allowed to watch TV. And we only yeah. had one, two, three and four. So we never really had... Oh, we didn't, yeah. We had the tape on... Re- yeah. Our nanny used to record, like, cartoons on a... Like a cassette tape. Yeah, I don't know they were called. Like, probably Tom and Jerry or something. Tom and Jerry. Yeah, like, I don't know. We really didn't watch that much television. Yeah, we weren't we really allowed. Yeah. We yeah, just really watch kicked balls at each other's face. Yeah, we were lucky to not be allowed to watch The Simpsons and we got to secondary school in our like sixth class. Yeah, she banned us watching The Simpsons. Yeah. yeah. That was that was pretty common in <laughs> yeah, like grown up, wasn't it? So. That people just weren't allowed to <laughs> yeah. watch The Simpsons. So random. Um Ailish, what's your nickname and why? Swish. What's the well, Ducky? Sh- yeah, but that's only like a family one. Yeah. The Swish one is kind of more publicly right. known now. Um, they from. struggled with Ailish oh. in Australia. I didn't have a nickname before I went to Australia in terms of like a sporting, like, but Australia has to give everything a nickname. Of course. Yeah. Um, so Ailish was hard for some people to say and for, to remember. So they were kind of trying to think of something along the lines of Lish or Swish and then someone just like Swish, Swishy. And then 
that's Gorgeous. where I came from. So it's not nothing to do with me being fast or being good at basketball. It's just a just easier, just to easier pronounce. swish. So it was like it could have been a lot worse. Do you have any nicknames, Ray? No, like I've awful ones because <laughs> like my college friends were really mean and they used to call me <laughs> Ponzi Ponzi because I used to wear a pink bandana. And I had white boots, socks pulled up and parents like, was pretty fancy. And then the emerinator. So like, um. I couldn't like, I've got the worst one. So it's, it's just good. <laughs> so it's like, that has probably gone away, the emerinator. But it surfaces every so often when people remember. We yeah. have a mug at home to remind you. Yeah, you? Keith, my brother, got me a mug of me in that air ad. And then it wrote the emerinator on it. So like, there's a mug that is evidence yeah. there as well. But And as no. soon as this comes out <clears throat> people will start calling you. you back again <laughs> but yeah um do you what's your favorite food Eilish? peanut butter peanut butter uh Imer, what was your favorite subject in school pe <laughs> and then do either of you have a hidden talent it was very good at singing really good at singing is that oh, yeah is it really good yeah she's really sing. good at singing okay Breaking. <laughs> <laughs> Cut. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, but we all play music, but yeah, you can. You got to grade eight in the piano, so you can play pretty. Oh, that's pretty me. impressive. Yeah, like that was then. That was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, we haven't time for it at the moment. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's I can it. draw. That's about it. Yeah. Great. Well, again, thank you so much for joining me today and for all of your really insightful answers to those questions and um, really enjoyed having a chat. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Tackle Your Feelings podcast. To find out more info about the topics discussed and for tips on your own positive mental well-being, as well as information about and how to sign up to the Tackle Your Feelings Schools programme, please visit tackleyourfeelings.com.